um, identification of future needs um, from Ken this morning, uh, Commissioner Schatz this morning. Um, Commissioner, thank you. Um, committee using hand raising, do you have any questions? And Topper has a question. His hand yeah, is on my hands up. Uh, oh, I, thank you, Topper. I did not uh, see that. That's Please okay. go All ahead. Right. All right, um, uh, uh, Commissioner. Uh, from what I can uh, take from what you said, in terms of economic services by itself, um, you you seem to be uh, okay. Um, what I'm looking for is is there any help that you need from us? in that area. So I do appreciate that question, thank you. So the reality is we're still gathering information, particularly with respect to the financial implications of this kind of increase. We're certainly appreciative of the fact that the federal government, of course, just passed the stimulus bill. It is complicated. What we need to do first is analyze what money is available um, with respect to, uh, in this case, it may be TANF, um, to, to know how much we're receiving in Vermont from the federal government. And it, after that, we then would uh, potentially make requests of you for additional financial support. Uh, the federal government has made it pretty clear that um, any state resources that are already committed could not be uh, replaced by federal resources. So we want to take advantage first of the federal resources that are available. So we need a little bit more time to be able to make the re request of you, but I appreciate the question. Thank you. Are there um, other questions? I have a question. Can, can you identify yourself? Yeah, Mary Beth Redmond, um, and I put my hand up, um, so yeah. I'll, I'll lower it now. Um, okay. Thanks, Topper, Ken. Could you, sorry, Topper, could you lower your hand too? Thank you. Thanks, Ken, for, for uh, being with us today and for all your work. I couldn't imagine your job before this uh, event, and now it's just in inconceivable uh, with what you're handling. So thank you to you and your staff. Um, I am hearing from nonprofits who are concerned about cash flow, and a lot of these organizations are the boots on the ground organizations um, providing you know, this care. And I'm just wondering, um, if there's been any discussion of that relative to um, money flowing from the state for those who are providing care of COVID-19 patients and others who are kind of on the front lines, you know, has there been any discussion? We certainly don't want these organizations to um, go bust in the middle of dealing with this crisis. So I just wondered if you had any perspective on that or any information. So we're definitely concerned about it and appreciate the, the problem um, and we've definitely been talking about that and we'll get into that more deeply. Um, Melissa will talk about the efforts were made specifically with respect to child care providers with exactly that thought in mind that we know we need to stabilize that system of care. And there are others similar to that, as you correctly point out, we really rely in Vermont very heavily on our nonprofit partners. So again, we're looking at what federal resources might be available to be able to provide enhanced support both in terms of pure numbers and again also uh, I'll talk more specifically with our business office staff in terms of the cash flow point that you made. I do, uh, I do of course get that and we're definitely mindful of that concern and working on it. Great. I, I'm particularly hearing from DAs, SSAs, you know, uh, the whole myriad of uh, nonprofit world. So just to put that in there, but thank you. No, I do appreciate that. And I know the Department of Mental Health and Dale have been talking very extensively, particularly with the designated agencies about their needs. Are there any questions, um, committee, generally, in a general, general questions for the commissioner? Or can we move now to more specifically um, childcare? Okay. Um, commissioner, um, are you 
kicking us off or is this something that, that um, Melissa is doing? How, what are, how is this going? I am gonna kick it off briefly and then turn it over to, uh, to Melissa. So if it's okay, I'll just dive in. Please do. Okay. So the reality, again, I know you've been following uh, very carefully the, the news and honestly the changes. And again, I want to uh, appreciate the fact that we are all being uh, carefully looking to the health department to provide, provide guidance and then the governor um, in terms of making uh, priorities and directives regarding um, the status of uh, activities in our community. And, and frankly, that's changed over time. Um, even in this relatively short period of time. So again, I wanna start by appreciating our staff in the Child Development Division, um, Let's Grow Kids, and all of our other network of support and providers of childcare, because we do recognize, the governor has recognized that childcare is actually a critical resource that enables essential persons to go about the activities, whether it's healthcare and first responders, or for that matter, grocery stores. Things, so many things are, are just essential to keep going, even while mo for the most part, we're doing our best to stay at home. So these directives have evolved a little bit over time. And uh, again, we have come back to this place where, where CDD is being asked to essentially provide child care through our child care providers in the community for essential persons' children. And we're doing that through a matching mechanism. And Let's Grow Kids has stepped up by creating a, a tool to provide information uh, that then CDD uses to match with available uh, child care providers. I will tell you that in, in context of how quickly we've had to move, how challenging this has all been, I think that the Vermont community deserves a ton of support and recognition for we really are managing reasonably well under the circumstances. So uh, to give you a little bit of data, we've, we understand that the total number of children um, who uh, are children of essential persons needing childcare is approximately um, 1,180. The number of slots available right now is a little over 2,000. Um, the, the point being that at this point, we have a total number of slots that allows us to meet the need, but also to be straightforward, there are pockets around the state where it's a little bit uneven. There are certain populations of kids where it's harder to meet the needs. And, and so specifically, um, and Melissa can talk more about this as needed, but Addison, frankly, and Essex counties are areas where we recognize there are some gaps. So I think, um, uh, we're working very hard with uh, child care providers and our uh, referral and support agencies to try to continue doing this matching. Again, as you probably know from uh, both the governor's presentations and also to be clear, there's a lot of guidance and information on our website. So I wanna make sure that you know that that's available and something you can look to uh, for very specific information. We have obviously made an effort to provide financial supports, both for families um, to, uh, and also for child care providers. Um, we, we did reach uh, an approach trying to be mindful of maintaining that support that we're asking families to pay 50% um, of their tuition or copay in order to preserve their slots um, once we get past this crisis period. We know that this is a challenge for some families, um, but the reality here is um, in terms of the amount of money that we're um, looking at, we felt that this was a, at this point anyway, a reasonable compromise in terms of maintaining the viability of the system, but also trying to support families. So as we go forward, we're continuing to uh, do this matching work continuing to uh, support both child care providers and families. And, and so let me now turn it over to Melissa to give you a little bit more specific information about how we're doing that. Good morning, everyone. 
Good morning. Uh, for the record, Melissa Regal Garrett, I'm the policy director at the Child Development Division for the state of Vermont. Uh, and I'm um, uh, happy to speak with you about the efforts uh, the division has made uh, in conjunction with the Department for Children and Families and the greater agency, and of course, the governor's office around childcare. Um, first and foremost, um, as Ken, uh, Commissioner Schatz mentioned, uh, we've made several pivots in the last couple of weeks uh, and the staff and team that I've been working with, um, I would be remiss not to call them out and say uh, they have done yeoman's work, putting in countless extra hours uh, to try to respond as quickly and effectively as possible to numerous pivots that we've faced. Um, first, we focused on stabilizing the childcare system itself, as Commissioner Schatz mentioned, a real value here around uh, having a system that exists on the other side of this crisis um, and ensuring that uh, families have uh, slots to return to as well as programs uh, are existing. Uh, so uh, we did put in a stabilization program. It's my understanding uh, we're on the cutting edge uh, nationally uh, in looking at it uh, in this way in stabilizing our system. Um, and uh, we are moving forward uh, right now, uh, knowing that there's an indefinite period uh, upon which we need to maintain this system. Uh, we did make a pivot uh, last week uh, to, uh, rather than covering 100% of tuition for families uh, that weren't able to make that payment, uh, we're now asking families to cover 50% of that tuition. Um, so, then uh, we have also been asked uh, while that childcare system is in a closure period to work with folks uh, to help provide childcare for our essential persons workforce uh, that are required to work outside of the home and have no other um, uh, resource available to them uh, for care for their children. I want to stress that on every level, the essential persons uh, childcare system is voluntary. Uh, it's voluntary for the child care programs uh, to step up and provide that care. Uh, it is voluntary for families to take advantage of that system. Um, and so, you know, with that, um, uh, it's been a little bit of a different experience for us uh, uh, in managing it. Um, we've approached it from a variety of perspectives, uh, having to really um, operationalize both financing mechanisms as well as um, the actual referral system that Commissioner Schatz referred to before. Um, and, uh, you know, we've had some values and some tenants that we have operated under. Uh, we have worked in close concert with the Vermont Department of Health, uh, mostly and highly concerned about uh, if we are providing this care um, outside of families' homes. How can we do so in such a way to mitigate um, exposure um, and to try to help protect the health of anyone that's involved in that system? Um, so uh, really uh, a consultation with um, Dr. Greena Holmes from the Vermont Department of Health uh, under the guidance of the state epidemiologists uh, and guidance from the CDC in terms of how we can uh, more effectively do this. Um, uh, Uh, I'll go on to say uh, that um, they, it's been a it's been a tough couple of weeks. Sorry. <laughs> Please, Melissa, you have and your staff have been pulling long hours, been doing yeoman's work, um, and you're in right in the center. And I know it's hard because you've got people coming at you at all corners. Thank you. Um, so I think I'll talk first about the financing system uh, that we uh, have worked on. And uh, the system has gone through um, uh, some pivots. Uh, like I said, we had the stabilization system. Part of stabilizing uh, the, that system did include a pivot in the way uh, we handle childcare subsidy. Uh, so um, previous to the crisis, uh, we paid out subsidies based on actual attendance of children. Uh, during this crisis, we've shifted to an enrollment basis. So for all kids that were enrolled uh, in childcare, we continue to make payments 
uh, to what we're referring to as their home provider or the provider they were enrolled in prior to the COVID crisis. Um, so, so um, Melissa, as you go through this, I know there's been, um, it, it's been an evolving process and there's been yeah. um, changes. So if you can be really clear as to where we are now. So uh, the decision's been made, we will continue to make those payments uh, through subsidy on behalf of uh, families to the home provider uh, throughout the COVID crisis. Uh, so the child care subsidy system uh, is something that um, we uh, did not pivot on uh, or make any changes to as we learned of the lengthening uh, period of the, of the response. Um, what we did change is there are families within uh, the subsidy system that uh, do need to make co-payments uh, to their child care providers. Uh, those are either um, built in or they are uh, on top of the co-payments that the subsidy system uh, requires just because there's a difference between what a family, what we pay and what a child care provider costs. So those families are being asked uh, to cover the 50% of that co-pay um, uh, as we shifted that stabilization uh, program. So what is the, they're being asked to cover 50% of the copay. What, if you can help us as to what that will mean in dollars per week and um, they may, um, the, the, the essential worker may be part of a two worker family of which the second worker no longer has a job. So uh, the ability to pay the copay, even 50%. So what yeah, happens so to them? What we're saying is um, just like uh, the entire workforce in Vermont that is uh, making adjustments, uh, either uh, not working or working from home uh, and are being asked to care for their kids in that home setting, that the same thing holds true for essential persons. So if they are working from home or if their um, family member, if they have a family member that is home that is able to care for their child, uh, that they uh, utilize that mechanism and that they don't utilize the external uh, system for care. Um, so with that, um, uh, again, um, we're relying on things like uh, the fact that the unemployment program um, has in fact gotten a boost uh, according to this, cri you know, as this crisis has evolved. Uh, in addition to that, the um, federal government and the package that they uh, just released uh, does have, um, you know, payments being made uh, to families and to individuals that have been laid off. So knowing that those pieces are in place, um, we did move to this 50% uh, cost share um, program for families. And that uh, applies as well to the copay for, for child care subsidy. I uh, don't know the answer to your question on a global or a systemic level. Representative Pugh, in terms of the impact uh, to each family, that's because it's so different depending on um, you know, the program that they've selected and if there even is a differential uh, that they are asked to make up. I can tell you um, my daughter is a subsidy family and um, her child care program is uh, closed uh, and her uh, work just uh, announced their layoffs uh, yesterday. Um, and as she went through her calculations, uh, her copay is typically $30 a week and she will be asked to make a $15 a week uh, copay. She's uh, typically earns about $15 an hour um, when she's working uh, generally. So. Um, just I, I can give you that as an anecdote, um, but I don't know uh, in terms of um, uh, how that impact looks uh, across the board. Are there other questions about the stabilization program before I move into how we're paying for essential persons? Um, are you all making any um, involved at all in terms of families who are not part of the um, Child Care Financial Assistance Program. Yes, so that's the other stabilization program that we rolled out uh, last week. Um, and uh, essentially uh, it, 
is it's rolled out in two parts and that's because the pivot in the length of time um, happened and we became aware of um, the financial impact of a potential long haul uh, in stabilizing the system. Uh, so the first part uh, is in effect uh, through the end of this week. Uh, and that part one of the stabilization program for private pay families uh, does, uh, uh, we are asking Vermonters who can afford to cover uh, their current slot in childcare, their closed childcare program, to continue to do so. If they're unable to do that, uh, that system uh, will pick up 100% um, of that tuition. Uh, with that, we're asking programs to continue to pay their staff. Um, and we're asking programs to preserve the slot uh, for those families. Uh, when the crisis is over, families have a chance uh, to return to those slots. Uh, and and it is, it, it's the provider. So the family has to say to the provider, I can't pay for this and the provider contacts you. That's correct. We have a, um, a, a system we've operationalized uh, to try to create a structure around that to make it go a little more smoother. But yes, Representative, that is correct. Uh, we are pivoting that system um, at the end of this week uh, to uh, a 50% uh, requirement that families cover 50% of that uh, childcare tuition. Uh, and then we will uh, cover the other 50%. Um, uh, we're still asking families that can afford to pay 100% uh, to please do so, uh, but um, we will cover 50% uh, of that tuition. And with that, again, asking um, programs uh, to not lay off their staff uh, and to continue to um, uh, hold those slots for those families um, on the other uh, side of the crisis uh, so they can return to those. Thank you, Melissa. Um, committee, what questions um, do you have? And there's a whole list of questions in your, they, they all have their hands up. Can you see well, that? I, no, and I, I can't. I do have remarks that I can make on the, on the essential person system and financing and how we're um, handling referrals. I just wanted to get through the stabilized system first. Um, um, why don't you make some comment? I mean, please continue if you are. Okay. If you would. All right. All right. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, the essential person's child care system is a voluntary system. Uh, we do have values around that. One is the health uh, and safety of those involved. Uh, and under that, um, wherever possible, keeping families together, uh, keeping families in uh, their home programs, if those programs uh, have uh, remained open to serve essential persons. Um, and as we've made uh, decisions uh, moving forward, you know, those are some of the tenants that we are really uh, paying attention to. Um, uh, in terms of funding the essential person system, uh, we are um, offering to uh, any uh, on behalf of any child that is uh, within and being provided childcare, there's a $125 uh, incentive payment that we are making to programs um, for serving those children. Um, uh, families that uh, are uh, typically in the childcare system um, would have expected to pay tuition. And so they uh, may be paying tuition if the provider is charging that. Uh, I will. Um, just gently remind folks that it's a market-based system. And so there's some levers we can pull in terms of what we can say are requirements and others that we can't. Um, and so um, uh, tuition uh, may be being charged uh, to families that would typically be childcare um, families. Uh, recognizing that a lot of families, uh, as you probably are aware at the end of last week, uh, we were asked to also uh, utilize this voluntary system uh, to support uh, children uh, K-8. Are we okay? <laughs> yes, um, sorry. Uh, no, that's okay. Um, and so um, as we've done that, uh, that addition, um, we did look at this and recognize those families otherwise would not have been budgeting or expecting uh, to pay tuition. Um, and the state is uh, offering a 300, uh, nope, Sorry, a $200 a week uh, tuition payment on behalf of uh, 
children that are in the K-8 system. Um, so those are the financial supports that we're providing um, around essential persons uh, moving forward. Um, the system to find care um, uh, has been uh, a bit of a um, challenge uh, to set up uh, and it's involved uh, the cooperation and the uh, work of so many folks, both internal and external to state government. And, um, you know, I'm gonna call out a, a few of those as I go through and describe this system, but um, I can't tell you that if it wasn't for private uh, public partnerships, uh, we would not be as far along with this as uh, we are. We would not have had the response that we've been able to make as quickly as we have. Um, essentially, um, our partners at Let's Grow Kids uh, were able to really quickly set up a uh, electronic mechanism, a collector tool for any essential person uh, needing childcare to put in their information. Um, and they are twice a day uh, providing the child development division with that data. Um, our child development uh, division uh, simultaneously has a team of 12 licensors, uh, four licensing techs, and three licensing supervisors uh, that have been working around the clock to contact uh, each and every one of our private uh, child care programs to learn if they're closed, uh, if they're remaining open, um, and if they're willing to serve essential persons. Um, for programs that are closed, uh, we've been collecting data on if they know if they have staff members that might be willing uh, to serve uh, essential persons in other capacities, uh, whether that's directly in folks' homes or uh, uh, moving to a uh, program that's open. Um, we also um, have uh, been asking if they have facilities that are currently closed, but uh, we know have been regulated, if they would be willing to have an external entity operate within their facility uh, during this closure period. So um, in this way, we've been anticipating the need uh, to fill gaps uh, and first and foremost, want to fill those gaps uh, with uh, folks that are within our regulated system, our staff that are already within the regulated system, as well as facilities that have already been regulated. Um, as uh, we've turned our attention to public schools now being part of that process, uh, that has in fact, uh, uh, it, it is a pivot that we are in the middle of. Um, and so uh, we do recognize that there are folks within the public school that while they may not uh, like paraeducators uh, or other teachers have gone through some of the rigorous background checks uh, that we're required to make, they have in fact had fingerprint checks and have been working with, with um, children in public school settings. So uh, looking to figure out um, who among them uh, may be available and willing uh, to provide care. And again, in terms of buildings and facilities, uh, where are there public schools that we may be able to utilize? So with all of that information, both the essential persons uh, that need care and then the facilities uh, that are currently open uh, to provide that care, uh, we hand that, uh, we clean it, uh, make it usable, and provide that information to an existing uh, referral specialist network uh, that's always been present to provide child care referral services to all families in the state of Vermont. Uh, they have been doing uh, an incredible job. They've made 449 uh, referrals uh, for families uh, to child care uh, in the last couple of weeks. Uh, that to my understanding is six to seven times uh, annually what they would have been doing uh, for childcare referrals. Uh, so just um, some incredible work by our community agencies and partners uh, on the ground uh, to help these families make the connections that they need. Um, we have uh, identified some places of gaps as Commissioner Schatz uh, noted. Uh, in particular, Addison County um, has um, a large uh, gap uh, we know um, there are uh, some gaps in Essex County and also in Franklin County. Um, and then um, finding a little bit of a pattern uh, in the Burlington and Chittenden area for children under the age of two. Um, so our team is uh, uh, really turning our attention to these gaps this week. Uh, we have several strategies uh, that we are using. Uh, as I mentioned before, as much as possible, uh, utilizing folks within the current system or programs that um, have been previously regulated. 
Um, we are also um, using uh, the variance option that is within our um, regulations uh, as effectively and as quickly as possible. Uh, that mechanism primarily is being used by programs right now in order to serve children in age groups that they did not previously serve, whether that's uh, being able to serve those K-8 students um, or being able to serve um, children. Uh, we have after school programs that are asking to be able to serve children younger than K-8. Uh, a lot of the pattern on that, again, is that idea of keeping families together. Um, so uh, those pieces are definitely in place. Uh, we've also um, asked our partners again at Let's Grow Kids, uh, also at Building Bright Futures, um, and um, some of the Head Start um, uh, local programs are really interested in, uh, is there a way to coordinate folks being able to find a family, friend, and neighbor care? Uh, so I do know that that uh, work is underway uh, within our partners uh, in that informal system of being able to match folks. I know they're exploring options uh, like Front Porch Forum, uh, potentially some of the nanny services uh, that exist. Uh, so trying to figure out, um, you know, how can we help uh, families that would prefer, um, um, or if there's not, a low, uh, if there's a gap and we're trying to address it, uh, how can we potentially use the informal world of family, friend and neighbor um, to, to do that? Um, there have been some interesting solutions, uh, even uh, with childcare programs themselves, uh, where rather than um, having their staff work in house, uh, they have sent their staff uh, to the homes of uh, essential persons, uh, perhaps because um, they didn't have enough uh, of a number of kids. So we are tracking and are aware of some of the unique options that are um, happening out there uh, to serve families. Um, so. I will uh, stop there uh, with some of the more general comments about uh, the pieces and parts that we're putting together. And um, it sounds like there are plenty of questions to uh, keep. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. And um, um, committee, I've got four questions um, from you all, four questioners, um, Teresa, then Dan, and then I've got two more. Teresa. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Thank you, Commissioner Schatz, and thank you, Melissa, both of you for being here, and um, which I know is a really stressful time. Um, I just have a, I'm gonna ask, I think I have like three questions, so I'm just gonna ask them and then I'm gonna mute me and then um, um, Chair will be able to move on. So um, the first is, uh, is there any verification process that the childcare providers are continuing to pay their childcare workers? I have had um, just one report of um, child care provider um, receiving the payments or anticipating receiving the payments and then um, still laying off um, the worker that they had. Um, so that was one. Um, you talked a little bit about um, continuing um, uh, the, the work that you're doing with schools. And I was just wondering if there's any um, regional differences, because uh, I know that at least some schools in, in our district here decided not to offer school facilities for childcare. Um, and um, it, I'm just wondering if you have any other regional disparities around that and if that's causing any um, issues for you. And uh, I thought I had three, but I guess I only have two, so that's it. Thanks for the question. Um, and you're bringing up uh, pieces that we have um, been absolutely grappling with uh, over the last couple of weeks. Um, uh, I will call out our child care financial assistance team. Uh, we have one of the lowest improper uh, payments rates in the nation in terms of um, making sure that our, um, our providers are actually following uh, the standards uh, that we establish uh, for payment. Um, and so this is no different a scenario, even though uh, we are making payments outside of the child care financial assistance program, we are using and utilizing uh, the team and the systems uh, in order to ensure as best we can uh, that um, folks are following the standards that we've outlined. Um, 
uh, I will say to you that some of this, frankly, is on the honor system of uh, Vermonters. Uh, and we see that play out uh, both in terms of this verification as well as the essential persons list. Uh, some of those pieces are, um, uh, as we are working through this, clicking more and more into place. Um, so as ACCD was able to really identify uh, codes that the Department of Labor uses, uh, it has enabled us to get um, better at um, ensuring that these payments are happening uh, properly and people are following those procedures. Um, uh, we do not right now have a system for verifying uh, paying workers. Uh, we would appreciate folks handing uh, that information in to the Child Development Division uh, if you are aware of that, because we absolutely will follow up on that. Like I said, we have a team uh, that's well versed in doing research on uh, these kinds of concerns. Um, our licensor on duty line um, uh, is our consumer concern line. Uh, same phone number, uh, folks can um, call in and just leave uh, that information for us uh, and we will follow up on that. Um, but I'll take this uh, concern back to the team and see if we can strategize um, how we might uh, be able to be more proactive about that, uh, Representative Wood, thank you. Um, and then in terms of the school's uh, system, uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, there is variety across the state in terms of what that public school response was uh, to that directive from the governor to provide the K-8 um, uh, childcare. Uh, and frankly, we just got that order, that directive from the governor to take that over last Thursday. Uh, we did have a little bit of a heads up um, and in anticipation of that, we added to um, our team of folks uh, that we meet with bi-weekly uh, external partners with our internal partners. We added Vermont After School. Uh, and that partner is uh, proving already to be incredibly beneficial because they were on the ground with schools while schools were trying to make determinations around um, uh, whether they're gonna provide care or not. Uh, and so they're already feeding our referral specialists with information about the schools that uh, were willing to do that um, and how they approached that. Some contracted with um, external partners to come in and do that work. Um, some uh, were trying to set that up and establish that on their own. Uh, what we are aware of is that schools um, uh, that were willing to do that work under the directive, now that they know that it's voluntary, um, are uh, choosing to focus uh, laser sharp on making sure that students um, have quality distance learning during this uh, closure period of the buildings of public school. Um, and um, uh, as, as fellow agency partners to the agency of education and to the uh, school-based world, um, we fully um, appreciate that task uh, and really support uh, the school folks in focusing on that learning um, for our public school students. Um, and therefore, um, you know, as we are um, helping them by providing this care for essential persons, um, you know, we're just beginning uh, on the verge of really understanding uh, what that system looks like. Uh, so we're setting up so, a survey. So, so, so Melissa, you're doing a really good job of giving us a really full and detailed um, explanation of how things are changing um, and that folks are doing. And I completely agree the best they can i'm trying to move you along because Absolutely. there are four three other people who have questions and then there are three people uh committee who have who are on the docket to testify and we have less than half an hour left got it um teresa did you get your question um answered the best that we can right now yes thank you um, Dan, and after Dan, Jessica. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Melissa, I just had a quick question. Um, how are you communicating to the families about the 50% ask? Are you, is, are you reaching out uh, directly or are you asking the, uh, the uh, care providers to reach out? Just thank you. Yep, right now um, it is in fact on the care providers uh, to do that outreach. Uh, we are uh, presently working as a team on frequently asked questions specific to families. Uh, that will be a tool that uh, providers can then utilize um, as they're uh, contacting and working with those families. Uh, the only families that we have uh, contact information for are just the child care financial assistance families, which represent about a fifth of the families that use the system 
prior to adding K-8 to it. So um, uh, we previously have and continue to not have a way uh, to make sure we can reach right. every family. So there is a, a okay. jump leap, leapfrog that happens there. So Melissa, if you could um, uh, send Julie a copy of whatever the communication was to the providers since the Thursday shift. Um, yes. Um, um, when it went from 100% to 50%. Some of us are getting um, calls of, of confusion as to what that really says. Um, thank you, Dan. Jessica, and after Jessica, Carl. Thank you. Um, so I have two questions. If families who have a child that, um, and they are essential workers, and they've been in the public schools, so they've never had to apply for child care financial assistance before. Are they able to apply now through your website? Um, yeah, absolutely, they can. Uh, our um, hope is that with the $200 tuition payment that we're making on behalf of those families and then the added $125 stipend, uh, that that's $325 a week per K-8 student. Uh, that um, families aren't, uh, the programs aren't going to need to charge yes. families. Okay, I wasn't sure if that $200 had to be applied, they had to qualify for it. So I, that's why no, I wouldn't. It's, right. it's for each and every essential person. A couple of grocery store folks have been asking. Okay. Um, the other piece is for the other side, not part, they're, they have, they're not receiving a subsidy, um, but they work. They're an essential worker who works in an area, this actually is in the intensive care unit, worried about the other children, like their child catching something from them, not wanting to put them in a full childcare center, have gotten support through um, having hiring one of the folks who worked in the childcare center in their home, but also need to pay 100%, they think, of the childcare um, at the site so they don't lose their spot because they're hearing that if they don't pay 100% they're going to lose their spot and wondering if that's really fair is is really okay and it sounds like what you're saying is 50% but this is someone who's outside of the CCFAP program so I just wondered how that works. Um, so again it's a market-based program and uh, all of the things that we've set up are voluntary. So uh, a child care provider on an individual basis that chooses to access our stabilization funding for that family, that non-CCFAP family. Um, right now, this week, uh, if that family can't make that payment, we will pay 100% uh, of that tuition on their behalf. Um, starting next week, um, we're asking that that family make 50% um, of that payment. If that child care provider is not um, opting into our stabilization program, um, that is a relationship, uh, a, a market-based relationship uh, that we are not able to really uh, get in the middle of. So that scenario could be happening, Representative, if uh, the child care program is not engaging in the stabilization program. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, Jessica, um, Carl. Thank you. Uh, this question's for Melissa. Uh, the, I've had some uh, providers who have brought to my attention that some of their staff think it's unfair that they're working to provide uh, care to essential workers. And yet there are child care centers that uh, where people are being paid, but uh, aren't providing a service to to children at this point in time. I, my best explanation is it's an extraordinary time uh, and but we're gonna have some, what appear to be inequities, but I, I wonder if you have a something maybe more concrete that I could uh, tell them. Absolutely. Um, so again, uh, it's a voluntary program um, and uh, we looked at it as a, uh, our approach was really around incentivizing uh, the programs to uh, continue to provide this care for essential persons. So that's what the $125 stipend for each and every child uh, was really an effort around. Um, and uh, we can't tell the programs what to do with that $125 um, per, per child stipend. 
Uh, but it would certainly be our hope that that would result in um, additional salary or bonuses or some sort of compensation uh, for the actual staff members that are doing that care. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Um, I still see hands raised. Um, Teresa and Carl, do you still, do you have other questions for um, Melissa or can we move on to Sonia Raymond? Sorry, I forgot to take my hand down. That's okay, that's okay. Topper, do you have a question? Okay, a quick question. We got three people in half an hour. Quick question. Why can't you tell them that, that subsidy? If you've got people that are being paid and not working and you have people that are working allegedly voluntarily, I don't know how that daycare, that child care center could stay open if they were doing, you know, if they didn't come to work. Why can't you tell them to use that money to, to provide more uh, uh, assist, not assistance, but pay to that worker that is in fact on site working, whereas the other one is not working and being paid fully? Mm -hmm. um Again, uh, it's not something that we have ever gotten in the middle of, uh, even with the Child Care Financial Assistance Program where we pay tuition on behalf of children to attend a program. Uh, they're a private business and they're really uh, setting up their budgets and making their, um, their businesses work. Um, I think that you're um, probably accurate that they're not going to attract uh, people to come in and do this work if they're not offering them uh, additional compensation, uh, keeping in mind that these folks aren't um, not compensated. They should still be being compensated um, under the stab stabilization program. Um, so um, it, it is highly likely that uh, the way programs are in fact getting uh, folks to be willing to do this uh, in an ongoing way would be uh, added compensation. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Fr um, Tapper, I'm sorry. We got That's three. Okay. We got three provider people who would like to, or yep. versions of that that I think would be important that we hear from. Um, and what I would be looking for, committee, as we think um, short and medium term, and commissioners were thinking short and medium term, if there is something that the legislature needs to do um, to address some of these issues. Um, Sonia Raymond from, um, you are the executive director of the Vermont Association for the Education of Young Children. Yes, uh, thank you very much for allowing me to speak today. Um, I'm also the owner of Apple Tree Learning Centers in Stowe, so I'm gonna be speaking from both perspectives a little bit today. Um, just in terms of our role with AC and what we are doing in the throes of this is we have sort of become, as I'm sure Let's Grow Kids and um, many other statewide organizations have become sort of the go-to points for um, a lot of the programs in the state. So they, when they have questions, um, they are coming and looking to us as statewide leaders to provide those um, answers as best we can. So we have spent a lot of time working with um, the different um, organizations and um, agency to try and get that information out to people as quickly as possible to steve off any confusion that we can. Not that there isn't any, because there is, but um, it's in an effort to work you know, with our partners to help that. So we've been sending out a lot of communications over the last two weeks um, and answering lots of emails and phone calls as I'm sure many other folks have. Um, I was asked to talk about sort of the general impressions. I have to say, uh, the package that Melissa spoke to is got to be the best thing going um, in this country. I can't imagine anything more supportive for this industry. Um, we entered this, pro you know, this situation two weeks ago, um, and business owners and providers were absolutely um, scared out of their mind. Uh, they are generally a week to two weeks from closing their door in the best of circumstances. And what has been put together as a financial package that Melissa just described is um, 
unbelievable, frankly. And it does allow, if people opt in, it does allow for um, programs to come out the other side of this and be able to provide a service for families again. Um, it isn't perfect. I'm not sure we could put together something perfect, but um, it, it does work and it does allow for that. Um, I will say um, most of what we're hearing with regards to that package is um, just some confusion about how it's working specifically and what they're supposed to be charging or not charging to whom and how, and um, not knowing who to speak to specifically to get answers. And so the one thing that I would say if it's all possible is to have, if we can have some sort of central housing for who you call or how you get your answers um, in the quickest possible manner, <laughs> that would be great. Because what people are tending to do is go to their licensors at this point. And the poor licensors, they don't have all the answers to, to all of this. They're doing the best they can. Um, plus they're trying to work with the programs that are still open and those that are closing and, and figure out how to help them manage things. Um, but I, I can say that that would be super important at this point um, for clarity around all of this. And, um, you know, I want to speak to the essential care piece, if I could, for a minute, because Apple Tree has chosen to remain open. And um, this wasn't after a great deal of thought. I could see the writing coming a few weeks ago myself on the wall um, and thought a lot about this idea before I was even asked if I would be willing to do it. And while I couldn't agree more that um, best case scenario is that every family have access to having care from you know, a family, friend, or neighbor um, for the least amount of touch points for the family as a whole in terms of um, possible infection and for some continuity. But I think given the circumstances, what is the folks that are choosing to do this are doing is providing something in the interim um, particularly because there are many families that actually just don't have access right now to family, friend, or neighbor that they can actually get this care from or feel that they don't have that. And so for us here, those are most of the families that we are serving, families who don't have other family in the area, who live in very rural areas, who um, don't have close relationships perhaps with their neighbors or neighbors who are not comfortable watching their children, knowing that these are people going off to work in hospitals and grocery stores every day. Um, lots of reasons. Um, and our numbers are very small, right? We have about 12 people enrolled right now. We used to have 95 a day. Um, so that goes to show you that Vermonters, in my opinion, are really trying to do the absolute right thing by their families. And for us, to the decision to open is, and do this was to fill the need. Um, and I can say that we did it initially and then we decided not to do it. And then we reopened when this new package and incentives came out for the essential um, providers. And I'll tell you that $125 that you were just asking about is a big deal. Um, it's actually what allowed me to feel okay about this for my staff because I was losing my staff every day that had agreed to do this initially. They were getting scared. They make like $15 an hour. They, you know, if they don't have health care, um, then what happens if they get sick? Um, so for me, this $125 is going directly to my staff. Those that are staying, it's going in their pockets, not mine. Um, and I really hope that that is um, what people are planning to do with this funding. And from the providers that I am speaking with, that is exactly their intention. It is to put it into their program um, to be able to stabilize their program and to pay um, those workers that are staying and working a significant um, increase so that they can A, access healthcare they might need and have not felt they could do the premium on before or to just for their family or whose spouse may have lost a job. So I do think um, that this has been a very important um, piece to have in place. And that was felt to me a direct response to having heard, I am sure, a ton of feedback from me and probably lots of other folks that we probably wouldn't have programs willing to stay open very long if 
we didn't do something to help the staff feel like they could do this and not fully, you know, jeopardize their families. So um, I could say a lot more, but I know that we have three other people that would like, or two other folks that would like to speak. Um, Sonia, this is uh, Representative Pew. Um, $125 per, per child um, is a good incentive. Um, what else do you need, either monetary or, um, and I'm speaking to you when you as the executive director of um, the Association for Education for Young Children, um, short term and then medium term, either in terms of funding or policy changes. Um, I think, you know, the basics of businesses will be covered. I can see that there might be some gap funding needed. Um, I think what programs are, that the ones that I'm speaking with are doing is really paring their expenses down to absolute bare minimum. But as this stretches over time, um, you know, the longer it goes, I think some of those cuts are going to become quite, quite vital to their business and they may need help to bring some of those back. Um, so I can see that perhaps needing change. The other thing that I would encourage some change in if possible is some policy around healthcare. Um, we provide healthcare actually at Apple Tree. Um, that does not mean that everybody can afford it even though we're paying half their premiums for them. Um, and I think for this industry, if we, anyone who is choosing to stay and do this type of care should have, and I know they can access it now through the state system, but it does not mean it's affordable for them, or at least that's what I'm finding with my own employees at this point. So some, whatever we can do to help that situation, I think would be important. Thank you. Um, with the exception of Topper, who's um, not on mute. Uh, uh, Topper, do you have a question for Sonia? No, I thought okay. I was on mute. That's OK. Um, I don't see any questions. Sonia, thank you very much. Thank you for deciding to remain, to reopen. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Um, Floyd, um, niece is next. Um, Floyd is the. I'm gonna speak um, from the Lamoille Parent Child Center and the perspective of Parent Child Centers. Um, so first of all, thank you all for paying attention to these issues. It's, uh, it's a matter of crucial importance right now. And, um, and I hate to be the bad news bear and I admire people like Sonia who has, uh, who has, am I still on <laughs> my computer? You just are still on, but for this is, um, um, you're on okay. at the bottom, um, but it. what you submitted for testimony, since we are on YouTube, is up there for people to look at. Okay, so you have my testimony written, and I'm just going to cover the highlights. Okay. Okay, first, um, asking child care providers to provide care in a congregate setting in the context of a governor's order that says stay home and stay safe those are those two things are in conflict, and I think that to that you're asking an awful lot for 125 bucks a day of people who are really taking great risks by um, by going to work every day. There are a bunch of questions that arise. One is how do you maintain um, social distancing among active children in a congregate setting? How do you do that with toddlers? How do you do that with infants who need to be changed, who need to be held? Um, so we have several PCCs that have uh, that have child care facilities, but don't have staff for them. And because their staff have either to, um, they need to care for somebody at home, they've got their own kids, they've got to do homeschooling, they're in a risk category. Um, and th so there are no staff. So some of those parent child centers have been asked to reopen 
their childcare facilities using some other caretaking arrangement like volunteers, teachers from area schools. Um, and that, you know, the, my, my legal counsel went nuts when he saw this because it doesn't, there are so many liabilities that present themselves that it's a, that it's a real risk to the organization itself, ultimately. Um, what happens if somebody who is attending your childcare, one of your children gets COVID-19? What happens then? Does the place shut down? Are you liable? Is it a workers' comp issue for the people who can't come to work anymore? Um, it's just a, it's a bundle of issues that haven't been addressed to date. Um, and you can see some, I've got them in there uh, so you can take a look at them. But so speaking for myself and not for the network, I want to say that I believe that I'm reading this. I believe that caring for these children in congregate settings puts them and their caregivers at great risk. It would be less risky to care for them in their own homes with relatives, neighbors, or friends. I've let my staff know that they, um, that if they want to, they can volunteer or they can, uh, they can decide to provide care um, in someone's home um, and that we will help them do that if they, if they feel like they can. But if as a last resort volunteers are used in children's homes, it would make sense for them to have an offsite infrastructure that they could call on for support, a hotline uh, like to uh, Building Bright Futures that they could reach out to with questions or if an unanticipated challenge came up. Finally, this emergency has brought into sharp focus the fact that the person ca cashing us out at the grocery store is as critical to our daily lives as the doctors and nurses caring for those who are ill. They should not have to put their children at risk while they themselves are at risk where they work. Schools are closed for a reason. School districts across Vermont have largely been unable to fulfill this directive for many of the same reasons. And districts that did begin to provide that, that care are now shutting them down. Barry is a case in point. It's an unsustainable and unsafe model with serious liability should anything go wrong. Closing congregate child care settings for all but the children of essential personnel means that the only children being put at risk in that way are the children of essential personnel. We have to find an alternative, and I think we can, but it's it just, we can't, we can't put kids in a congregate setting and put them at risk in this way. And that is all the bad news I have to give, but I do want to say one other thing. And that is that parent child centers are in the same boat as DAs and SSAs with regard to cash flow. Um, and uh, just wanted to point that out. Thanks. Um, thank you, Floyd. Um, I'm just so that we are clear. Um, are you speaking for Floyd Nice and the uh, Lamoille? Um, Parent Child Center, when you or are you speaking for the um, Parent Child Center networks um, broadly when you say congregate child care should not be the option? Um, I think I can say that I speak for the vast majority of the Parent Child Center network. And so that people should be um, going to individuals' homes. Yeah. And yeah, I think, I think, I think, you know, my, if my, uh, my child is exposed to 10 kids or, or I'm sorry, eight kids, because they need to be two adults in the room to eight kids in a given day. And those eight kids are exposed to their caregivers at home and whoever else they're exposed to. There's a multiplicity of risk there. That's pretty significant. Okay, um, committee questions for Carl, Teresa, I see your hand raised. Um, thank you. Um, Floyd, I just want to uh, ask you a question about the last statement you made with regard to cash flow. Um, I guess I'm making an assumption that if you have um, people participating in the child care financial assistance program, that you're getting the same payments that other child care providers are receiving. 
Is that accurate? That's correct. Okay. And then my second question is um, with regard to uh, the base payments, uh, you know, the grant payments that the Agency of Human Services makes, have you received any notification that there would be any change in those? No, we have not. In fact, um, you know, we made a point to the Agency of Human Services that it would be great if they could um, pay some of the uh, accounts receivable um, early, and they have. Okay. So, I, I mean, the truth is that we're, I don't think anybody's on the edge except perhaps in Rutland or um, where else? Anyway, I know Rutland would be on, is on the edge anyway, but so I don't think we, we don't need any emergency intervention at the moment. Okay, thank you. But we can all see them coming. Thank, thank you. you. Um, and Floyd, as usual, you um, have brought up um, some hard points and some things that we need to balance. And later this week or tomorrow or um, next week, we'll be talking more about um, sh short term and midterm um, solutions or responses. But our, the last person to testify and provide us with information today is Allie Richards, who's the um, um, CEO of Let's Grow Kids who have stepped up as an organization. Thank you so much, Representative Pugh and all of you. Um, I'll try to be brief. I know we don't have much time no. left. Okay, um, so I just truly appreciate the ability to share Let's Grow Kids perspective right now in such a difficult time. I'll pretty much as the last person on the roster be kind of underscoring a couple things and reacting to a few things. But I think it's helpful to know um, that the second this happened, it became an all hands on deck situation and we've all been saying. And so we ceased pretty much all of our normal activities at Let's Grow Kids and pivoted to working hand in glove with the administration, but also the early care programs on the ground. Sonia mentioned um, our federal delegation and the state and national advocacy groups. There's a lot of great TA and shared learning and people are knitting all of this together. And so we're trying to be kind of a bit of a clearinghouse to um, between all those various supports and sort of new information coming and going. So I think it might be helpful for you all just to um, hear what we've been doing, which really puts um, into focus what Melissa mentioned is a public private partnership, to maybe give you ideas of other things you might even request in, in the coming days and weeks. You know, I of think this that, that, that latter part would be very helpful right now. Perfect. Wonderful. Okay, so here's a summary, and then I'll just make two broad points at the end and, and that and open up for questions. So um, we're basically collaborating with the state to be a resource for child care programs and early educators on the ground right now. Um, part of that looks like collecting feedback from the early childhood field, relaying their concerns, triaging their concerns to the state and other policymakers, as Sonia mentioned. Um, we're also putting resources very regularly updated on our coronavirus website at Let's Grow Kids. And I think I wanna make a note that this is for early childhood educators and families and employers who are three key constituency groups that have risen up with needs and questions in this. A lot of guidance is coming fast and furious and some of it's not really digestible. So we're both posting it directly and helping to digest to make some of that a little bit more accessible for these groups as well. So that's constantly updated on our website. The other big bucket of work we're doing has been alluded to by many is this emergency care now for um, essential workers. Okay, and I want to just make a couple key points there. So as Melissa said, we're partnering with the state for that intake. It's purely intake and then it's passed right on to these CDD and these systems referral in place. But what we're also doing is really focus on the health concerns. So just as a quick, and I'm not the bottom line on this in any shape or form, we're working closely with CDD and Brina Holmes at Department of Health. And all I can say is we've been advocating very much and to people who are listening very closely to make sure that those who are doing this care have access to the absolute best health guidance uh, possible and and you know sort of the next wave of that is looking at health insurance and how can we think about you know sort of expanding that and supporting um, that to these folks but we co-hosted a webinar on the health guidance and I will say in sort of speaking with Brina they are thinking about what Floyd is saying very very carefully um, and they're looking at guidance they're, they're looking at best practice they're also looking at a lot of data that's coming out of centers around the world and in other places in this country and and seeing that actually in very very small settings um, with a lot of hand washing that the risk is quite low that young children really are not 
specters of this in many ways. So I, all, all I will say is I know a lot of thought is happening with good public health guidance there. Um, and I would bring up something that Vermont AUI or National Association, uh, NACI, um, has said time and time again, which I believe is really ringing true for folks at a time of crisis like this, uh, really um, highly qualified and prepared early childhood educators, an incredible resource. So in those cases where these children of essential workers can have that access to this care right now is actually a wonderful thing for them and their families during this time of crisis. Um, so finally, we continue to advocate for financial incentives and supports for these programs and the state is doing so, so much good work there, as you heard from Sonia. The other thing that we're doing is we're supporting the programs that have closed. Um, to do a series of things. You know, some of them do need bridge loans for a variety of reasons. Um, there are some small gaps that are still arising. So we're helping put a hotline together to get early educators. Um, wonderful people have stepped up. We're paying 50%, you know, and, and folks are doing 50% pro bono. People that you'll know around the state that do this great work, a lot of legal firms um, to give unemployment insurance advice and other HR related advice to this field right now. Um, and, and working with VSECU and the Vermont Community, uh, Vermont Community Foundation on some bridge loans to fill some of these gaps. Um, we've heard from so many people that want to help that we've set up an emergency fund for childcare and have a really wonderful response. And that money can be used for some of these things. Um, and we're really making sure that any federal and state policies really do take into consideration the childcare industry and the specific needs so they are not sort of left out in any way. We're also supporting families right now. They're really struggling in a variety of ways, making sense of this, being at home with their kids. Um, the good news is a lot of the childcare folks that are open right now, um, our are doing um, great work actually with continuity of learning. So I'd say we're actually now supporting some programs in um, doing that continuity of learning, what it looks like for childcare folks at kids of this age, how to support families and their children right now as an early educator that's, you know, um, not physically seeing those people every day. We're also really helping to support ramping up professional development for this field right now while they are still actively working and on payroll. Um, we're also really supporting employers on what flexible sort of benefits look like for their staff right now at this time, um, having them step up to support childcare in a variety of ways. Uh, the last thing I'll mention is we're pivoting to supporting more of this informal care, as sort of Floyd saying. It is a piece of the puzzle, as Melissa said as well. And we've been working with CDD. And um, at this point, it really looks like setting up resources for families to access um, these informal networks. And I will say one really bright spot is a lot of medical students can't be working right now because of the crisis and they are background checked and they have first aid and they're ready and willing and raring to do this. So we're sort of um, thinking about ways basically to link them and other folks up like that um, who want to go into people's homes and be a part of this puzzle um, that we're all sort of seeing come into shape now. Um, and so that's, uh, that's continuing work that we're doing with CDD. So really two, two final things I just want to say. I just have to thank you all and thank the state of Vermont. As others have said, we are. We are the best in the country right now in this moment. We're following best guidelines using CCFAP flexibly in the way that, by the way, you all have said in, in your five-year redesign plan, it should be used, you know, not only in a time of crisis, but generally like this. Um, so it's it's the right direction. Your groundwork and thoughtful work on this has helped put us in this place where we're the only state right now that has said, we're going to be darn sure you can open up your doors when this is over. This is such a vital resource for us, and we're going to make sure of that. And now these folks don't have to worry about being bankrupt while they do this continuity of learning for their families, while they do crisis um, emergency care for essential workers in some cases. That is so huge. I have to underscore that point. Um, I also have to say, you all know this painfully well too, the lack of having a modern IT system right now for CDD and, and AHS is crucial. It's impeding efforts. States that have made these investments, like the ones that you've already set in motion, but we haven't finished in Vermont, um, have made things so much faster, identifying gaps, linking people to care. It's just really, we'll continue to find huge points like that in this crisis together for policy moving forward, but I just have to mention that one. Um, so all that is to say, I would urge you all um, in understanding sort of the magnitude of both the problem facing, you know, the early care and programs and the significant stepping up that the state has done to really support 
this industry. Thank you. Um, but I'd love for you to make sure that you're looking at federal and state dollars to support and basically back up what the state has done. Thank you. Thank you. Um, someone, uh, there's a, someone has their something on because there's a reverberation. Um, Carl, you have um, the final question in the last minute that we have, um, and clearly folks who are listening, we'll be continuing conversations around childcare and where to move next. We've spent a lot of time this morning saying be, what people have been doing. We need to know, we need to move forward and what needs to happen forward. Um, and Ali um, and Melissa, thank you for, and uh, <clears throat> Floyd, thank you for identifying some of those things. Carl. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, my question, I don't know whether it be Melissa or Ali could answer this, but what, is it true then that somebody that, let's say, was working, providing uh, child care for uh, essential workers in a, in a daycare facility, and they ended up having to stay home because they thought they were contracting uh, a cold or something like that? Would they be going on unemployment or would they be going on, uh, what do you call it, uh, workers' comp? Melissa, do you want to take that one? Sure. Um, what we understand from our partners at the Department of Health is that there, because this is such a community-wide and widespread uh, uh, contact scenario, there really is no exact way to pinpoint where someone may have uh, come in contact or contracted uh, COVID-19. Uh, therefore, this is not a workman's comp issue because uh, there's no way to actually prove uh, that someone uh, uh, had that contact uh, and actually uh, uh, contracted COVID-19 from a child care program. Um, it, Thank you very much. That, that, uh, that, that's helps. a good, good, clear answer. Um, what I would um, ask committee, thank you for this last hour um, and a half. If you have questions for um, any of these um, folks that we've heard from, if you could write them down and email them to Julie um, Tucker, our committee assistant and myself, um, committee members, we will in see how we can get them back to, um, or someone back to us to answer them. But clearly this is the first step in um, where do we go from here? And we'll be having that conversation, if not in another meeting this week, that's not scheduled or at the very beginning of next week. Committee, thank you very much. Um, we're going on our lunch break and we're coming back at 2.30. Help someone, coming back at 2.30 um, where we're gonna be talking about Woodside. So thank you all very much. And um, this is the end of the morning for House Human Services. Bye.